Hello, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our Webinar Wednesday series. My name is Kelly Hall. I'm a marketing coordinator for ALS North America. Our presenter today is Howard Force. Howard is a degreed senior chemist with ALS Global with over 30 years of experience in analytical chemistry. Today, Howard will be discussing the laboratory analysis of PFOS and TOP assay. During this presentation, feel free to use your ask a question box, your chat box, or the raise the hand feature to ask any questions. All questions will be answered at the end. Howard, thank you for taking your time to deliver this presentation today. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for everybody for joining today. So over the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I'll be talking about per and polyfluorinated substances, also known as PFAS. This talk will be similar to uh, talks we gave last year, but there will be new information in this talk. So agenda, I'll give an overview of these compounds, talk a little about chemical structure, where and how the compounds are used, why they have environmental concern, a general overview on their toxicity, something on transport, uh, current government regulations, and basic information on analytical techniques, and then a, a little bit about top assay. So PFAS includes thousands of compounds with um, varied uses, characteristics, environmental profiles. And so today we're going to talk about a subset of PFAS called the perm polyfluorinated, also known as low molecular weight or long chain, short chain PFAS. And these are um, PFAS with carbon chains that vary between uh, four carbons and 15 carbon range. Chemical structure of PFAS give them a uh, unique properties such as thermal stability and ability to repel water and oil, which makes them very useful in a wide variety of products and processes. These compounds have been in production since the late 40s with mass production starting about the late 50s uh, through today, and so there's over 4,000 different PFAS uh, that may, be, uh, may have been manufactured and used in a variety of industri industries <clears throat> worldwide since, uh, since the inception of the 40s. So the EPA Toxicity Substance Control Act, TOSCA's chemical substance inventory list uh, has over 1,000 PFAS uh, listed, of which approximately half are known to be commercially active within the last decade. Many PFAS are found in a variety of consumer products and industrial processes, including uh, well-known uh, firefighting foams, chemical processes, uh, in construction, aerospace, electronics, semiconductors, automotive industry, and used in stain and water resistant coatings, uh, such as carpet and rain repellent clothing, also food packaging, and waxes and cleaners. And so to do their desirable chemical properties for consumer goods, PFAS are widely used in commercial products and can be found in almost every U.S. home and business. So PFOA and PFOS, two of the most widely studied of the PFAS, have been detected in blood serums of about 99% of the samples collected in a study between 1999 and 2012 in a population that is pretty representative of U.S. Most recent studies suggest blood levels of PFOA and PFOS have been decreasing since some U.S. manufacturers voluntarily phased out production uh, starting in about 2004. These compounds are composed in an alkyl chain where all of the hydrogen atoms are replaced with fluorine atoms to make a hydrophobic linear carbon chain. And then that is bonded to a hydrophilic water-loving functional uh, group, a carboxylic acid, sulf uh, sulfonic acid. In the environment, most PFAS are found in their ionic state, as shown here. PFOA and PFOS are what we call perfluorinated PFAS, meaning they're um, all of the hydrogen on the tail have been replaced with fluorines. And then down below, we have an example of a fluor telomere A2, FTOH, and you can see that the tail and the head are separated by a uh, carbon hydrogen link. So these would be called uh, polyfluorinated compounds. PFOA and PFOS, main industrial applications. Applications were uh, processing aids and surfactants used in the emulsion of polymerization for chlorpolymers, 
Uh, sustain rebalance for fabrics, as we said, as uh, surface activating agents used in a variety of products, such as the firefighting foams. Many different uses in the coating industry and in, involved in many uh, production processes of uh, electronic parts. So PFAS has been phased out of production and use throughout the U.S. and other uh, first world countries. 3M, for example, ended uh, production in 2002. And around that same time, production was started in Asia by other companies and has increased in those regions since. So this slide, uh, some, some PFAS contain non-fluorinated carbons next to the functional group, as we said. And these are known as telomeres, as we saw on the earlier slides. slides. And then, um, in the environment over time, abiotic and biotransformation of these polyfluorinated compounds, also known as PFAS precursors, uh, will break down and produce stable PFAS compounds, such as uh, perfluoroalkyl acids. And we'll cover, it's gonna be important, remember, because we'll be covering a little more of this when we talk about the top assay later. So environmental concerns, <clears throat> persistence, the CF bond is a short, very strong chemical bond. Thus, many PFAS are highly stable and resist typical environmental degradation, including atmospheric uh, photooxidation, direct photolysis, hydrolysis, uh, microbiological degradation. In the environment, some anionic forms of PFAS are water soluble and can migrate from soil or sediment to water and be transported long distances. By a cumulative, the C8 and the higher carbon chain PFAS bind to proteins in the blood and liver and not adipose tissue. And C6 and lower carbon chain PFAS are more water soluble and appear to uh, uh, not bioaccumulate and get passed out through urine and feces in humans and animals. Bioaccum potential increases with the length of the carbon fluoride chain. Studies have found PFAS in the blood of samples of the general human population and wildlife worldwide, with higher levels found in around industrial areas, which kind of makes sense. Um, PFAS is about a PFOA has a half life in the human body about 2.3 years. In regards to adverse human health effects, some studies suggest. PFAS may have effects on human health by increased liver weight and size, interfering with cell function, uh, responsible for maybe thyroid disease, low birth weight, high cholesterol. Um, PFOA has been reported to be linked to kidney and testicular cancer, but then other studies conducted are inconclusive as far as the PFAS human toxicity. Most available toxicity data are based on laboratory animal studies, but there are also several human epidemiological studies of for people and PFOS. Exposure to some PFAS above certain levels may increase the risk of adverse health effects, while many of the same effects are observed for that family of PFAS chemicals. So it kind of appears that different uh, adverse effects may be dominant in different PFAS. So EPA plans to continue evaluating toxicity information for PFAS. Um, critical information is going to come from investigation whether the exposure to structurally similar PFAS result in similar health effects. <clears throat> People are exposed to PFAS throughout the use of consumer products, um, through occupational exposure, through consuming contaminated food or contaminated drinking water, from public and private well systems. And you know, typically those are localized and associated with a release from a specific Facilities such as a manufacturing area, a processing plant, landfill, wastewater treatment, or facility using uh, PFAS containing firefighting foams. Also exposed to consumption of plants and meats from animals, including fish that accumulated PFAS. Consuming of uh, foods that have come in contact with PFAS containing products, such as the microwave uh, popcorn bags, grease resistant papers used in fast foods. And then just use of living with or otherwise being exposed to commercial household products, personal products, uh, indoor dust containing PFAS uh, from use of water repellent textiles, and including carpets and clothing and footwear, nonstick products such as cookware, use of polishes, waxes, paints, and then also employment uh, so somebody working in a, a place producing these or that is using this. In, um, uh, production 
using a PFAS in a production facility. So PFAS enters the environment through several ways, emission releases from manufacturing processes via the air or waterways or solid waste. Everyday use of PFAS containing products adds to the sewage systems, where some are dropped out in the sludges and biosolids, and some will pass on through the treatment plant into the waterways. Plant application of biosolids is common and potentially could be a pathway for reintroduction of PFAS into waterways. Landfill leach can also be a path for reintroduction of PFAS uh, into the environment. So we said there's many different uh, parapolyfluorinated substances and aqueous film forming foams, or AFFF foams, uh, used in firefighting and firefighting training areas on uh, commercial and military based around the US. And these areas are of significant interest, being that the military accounts for about 75% of all AFFF, um, these aqueous film forming foams used. This slide is just a typical diagram of transport model for PFAS in the environment. So the PFAS with uh, anionic heads with the shorter CF chains, as we said, tend to have the higher solubility. And uh, as I said earlier, PFAS is usually in an ionic form in the environment. And they could be anionic, cationic, or as winter ionic. And PFAS carbon chains do have a minor negative charge. And thus, there's potential for an electrostatic attraction between the negative charge PFAS tail and positive charge mineral components um, for sequestration, but mostly it's just absorption um, that the sequesters uh, PFAS into soils. And um, then he said some of the, the lighter or shorter chain uh, carbon foil bond um, chain PFAS tend to be more soluble and move off from the source zone. So regulations, in May of 2016, I probably everybody knows this, EPA established the drinking water health advisory level of 70 part per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. And when found together in water samples, the combined concentration is compared against 70 PPT. So EPA plans to release a toxicity assessment for Gen X, which is a replacement, we call a replacement PFAS, and perform butate sulfonic, sulfonic acid this year and the draft uh, was out for comment this year and was closed in January, out last year really and closed in January. And so uh, toxicity values for five other PFAS are under development as well. So EPA will propose a regulatory determination for PFOA and PFOS in 2019 and have that for public comment. Uh, regulatory determination is the next step in the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act process for developing a national preliminary drinking water regulation with MCLs in place. So EPA also intends to propose nas nationwide drinking water monitoring for PFAS under the next UCMR monitoring cycle, which will utilize new methods available to detect different PFAS and at lower minimum reporting levels than previously possible in the earlier uh, uh, UCMR uh, monitorings. So as part of this process, EPA will intend to solicit input this year and issue proposed drinking water monitoring rule for UCMR 5 that will begin in 2020. EPA has uh, initiated the regulatory development process for listing PFOA and PFOS under surplus hazardous substances. So a hazardous substances designation under CERCLA provides more options for the federal government to facilitate use of response and enforcement of uh, PFAS release. So the states, uh, several states are taking action uh, related to PFAS, including product labeling, consumer product laws, chemical action plans, listing selected PFAS as hazardous waste or designated selected PFAS as hazardous substances through state specific authority, and developing standards and guideline, uh, guidance values to um, limit concentration of PFAS in groundwater or drinking water. PFAS can be considered uh, pollutants under the Clean Water Act, and states can use the NPDES uh, permit regs to control discharge from point sources containing PFAS into receiving waters, including sources of drinking waters. So to support uh, states in managing their water quality, the EPA will evaluate development of uh, ambient water quality criteria under the Section 304A of the Clean Water Act.
So ALS Kelso has been analyzing samples for PFAS for many, many years, 15 plus years. Uh, this year, our Holland, Michigan laboratory will be offering PFAS analysis as well. Typical sample matrices we see on a daily basis are listed here. The majority of the work we are doing is in supporting government and DOD investigation of environmental contamination from AFFF release used in firefighting activities and investigation of uh, concentration of PFAS used in manufacturing. There are published methods for PFAS analysis. Best known is um, one is uh, EPA 537 REV 1.1 for drinking water. Uh, this method covers 14 analytes. Uh, on November 2nd of last year, EPA published a updated method for 537 REV 1.1, and it's called EPA 537 REV 1. Uh, the revised method includes four additional PFAS. Uh, these are the replacement uh, PFAS called GenX, there's a Donna, and then two components uh, that fall under the F53B PFAS. And as I said, these are these are going to nickname the replacement PFAS due to their shorter carbon chain that developed to replace the longer uh, chain perfluorinated compounds. There's also a DOD QSM 5.1 table B15 requirement that you must follow if you're going to be DOD certified to do uh, PFAS analysis uh, for under your DOD certification. ALS, like um, I said, 15 years ago, developed the in-house method. Um, for these methods were published. We use uh, a method that's as this method for non-DOD or non-drinking water work. The in-house method uh, pretty much kind of follows what uh, the DOD method requires, but our final reports look a little different. EPA is working on new methods that will be under SW846. So there's going to be EPA 8327 and 8328. And I've heard that they may be splitting 8328 uh, into another one called 8329, but I haven't confirmed that. But the 8327 is a direct inject LCMS method for screening of surface and groundwaters and wastewaters. And 8328 is going to be a solid phase extraction isotope pollution method for non polluable waters and soil and sediment and waste. And last I, information I had that was that 8327 was in method validation and 8328 was still in draft form at EPA. It's a list of some other methods that we don't offer. Uh, ISO method was developed for analysis of. Uh, Linear isomers for PFO and PFOS and used internal standards, but no isotope dilution. Um, and some of these methods, uh, they've been validated uh, by various EPA regions, uh, but uh, for the most part, there's not been, uh, they've not gone through multi lab validation, so we've really not uh, brought these online. So at Kelso, we offer a 537 RAM 1.1 for deep depth for drinking water, so we change that over to the 537.1. Then our DOD methodology and then our in-house 537 modified. And Holland, Holland Michigan Labs probably going to offer their similar, uh, similar methodology. And just a little bit on prep. Water samples, we take 250 mils, we adjust the pH. Um, acetic acid, and then these will go through a solid phase extraction using uh, a particular uh, Stratax LAW cartridge, and then um, the cartridges are cleaned and uh, we elute the analytes, and then these will go on to uh, viral carb clean up if needed, or even some concentration steps, and then on to the LCMS MS for analysis. And all of these use isotope, all our water analysis except for drinking water, use isotope dilution um, analysis, drinking water to the 537. And one, uh, REM 1.1 do not call for uh, isotope. Then soils, uh, we take a step by metal uh, gram mass and we do a sonication for three hours and change the pH, interviews and stuff, run it through uh, Empire Park cleanup and then off to uh, of course, using ice depth dilution, but then off in LCMS and S analysis. And tissues, freeze dryer tissues, we do an acetic acetonitrile extraction. 
uh, and sonication, and then we do run these through uh, SPE uh, cartridges again, and then we also do the EnviroCarb to remove interfering uh, bio, uh, bio that are quite common in, um, in uh, fish tissues. Just a picture of a couple of LCMS SMSs, so you know, kind of like what they look like, big boxes. Following five slides list um, other PFAS that ALS Kelso currently analyzes uh, on, a, for on, a, on a routine basis, and I've kind of separated them out by, by functional groups. So uh, here we have the perfluoral carboxylic uh, acids with uh, um, carbon chains from 4 to 14, people uh, perfluorothenoic acid, etc. The next group, perfluoral sulfonates. And this side is our perfluoroctane sulfonamides and sulfonamido ethanols and acetic acids. And this slide shows the four telomeres sulfonates and our poly uh, floor replacement developed uh, with some shorter chains. Uh, these compounds, as as we said, we're known as, as, as replacement um, compounds and are we're supposed to have less toxicity, but uh, their in toxicity environmental impact are uh, in question as well these days. So Gen X and, um, has a three carbon foreign chain. Madonna has a short chain broken up with oxygens uh, that were dispersed between the, in, in the carbon foreign chain. And F33B, it has similar structures um, as well. This additional PFAS that are soon to be added to our list. So um, what's going on at EPA is uh, EPA and its research and development contractors are using non-targeted analysis to ID new and other PFAS analytes in the environment. And most of this work's being done by LC time of flight or uh, LC QTOF time of flight mass spectroscopy. And these systems give a, a full mass spectral data uh, for a more extensive than what our, uh, our uh, targeted uh, MSMS systems do. And so they get a much larger dynamic range with lower sensitivity and are able to um, ID uh, structures and determine what other PFAS uh, compounds they're finding in the environment. And so this is kind of why these have, have come about and are being added to the list. And so we're gonna, we're gonna see more and more PFAS to requested it like list as the months and years go on. The standard reporting limits, we report most water uh, limits at five nanogram per liter. Some plants want them down to two nanogram. We can do that. Uh, soil sediments are at about one ppb and tissues at 0.25 ppb. So total oxidizable precursor assay, or the top, top assay, so we said there's thousands of compounds classified as PFAS, but we only analyze a, a small set of those by LCMSMS, the target compounds, maybe 30, 35 key analytes, and such as the, you know, the selected uh, per four alkyl and uh, carboxylic acids, sulfonic acids, uh, sulfonamides we've been talking about. So many of the firefighting foams and other products containing PFAS, where, where the, uh, the bulk of these materials can be polyfluorinated compounds, with different functional groups. So uh, these compounds are referred to as PFAS precursors. As we talked about earlier, over time, you can get a uh, breakdown of these precursors into environmental product, um, or environmental PFAS compounds uh, with, um, that will go, go, not go through any further degradation, kind of their, their terminal degradation product, or we call it dead end product. And, and those would be such as people, uh, um, PFAS and perfluorohexanoic acid. So to get an idea on the concentration of uh, precursors in a product, in product or uh, soil contamination, water contamination, say at a source site, uh, a sample will be analyzed by top assay. So the assay is, it's a pretreatment method that utilizes hydroxyl radical produced under uh, heated alkaline conditions to oxidize 
the precursors to a perfluoroalkyl carboxylic acid. Uh, these analytes can then be extracted and analyzed by traditional PFAS analysis. So we were converting the analytes we don't analyze for into ones that we do analyze. So water samples are diluted with uh, aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide, potassium or sulfate. The samples are then incubated in a sealed uh, container at 80 C for um, 80 degrees C for about six hours. Solid samples, we do an extraction with methanol and then uh, take that extract down to dryness and bring it back up and uh, go through the oxidation step. Prior to oxidation, the samples uh, are spiked with an isotopically labeled precursor so we can measure the oxidation uh, oxidation efficiency. So if full oxidation occurs, the label precursor should be non-detect when we, um, when we uh, analyze the samples after oxidation. You can also add labeled perfluorinated compounds, the dead end compounds, uh, such as the label, as labeled PFOA to show that there is no degrade, degradation of these uh, compounds during the oxidation step. So I just results of some studies we've done and work we do. And so what we've got going on here is uh, spike water and soil analysis shown on the slide here indicates greater than 90% uh, of the spiked perfluoroalkyl sulfonamides and four telomeres acids were successfully degraded by the oxidation procedure. So what we, and then our recovery uh, of our uh, isotope label precursor was less than 5%, so we got really good oxidation here. So what we see is, um, here's what we spiked our um, far left, and hopefully my mouse is showing, is what we spiked with concentration, and then this is what we were, this is for the labeled precursor to, uh, to determine how well our oxidation step is going on. Um, and we got zero recovery, or five, less than 5% recovery. So it shows really good degradation. Then uh, the precursors are the green back here in the center. We uh, spike with those and then did our oxidation step and did the analysis and they are all gone. The dead end compounds were not uh, degraded. So we spiked with PFBS, XS, OF, PFOS. and basically got the same values here. Um, what we spiked is what came out. And here's what was produced. So all of these uh, precursors degraded and turned into uh, dead egg compounds, predominantly in this example, is PFOA. So for most real world samples, we see the procedure can successfully oxidize perfluoroalkyl sulfonamides and telomeres sulfonic acid to the perfluoroalkyl carboxylic acid uh, without really affecting a uh, recovery of um, um, the other sulfonic acids. And so in some matrices, we see that Oxidation may not be complete due to high organic content uh, in the sample, and so we have to uh, dilute the samples and do further uh, oxidation to get these down so we get decent data. So EPA just last month uh, published this doc, EPA's per and polyfluoroalkyl substance PFAS action plan, and as a, a lot of information, I suggest. Uh, if you want to see what uh, EPA is up to uh, and going to be up to in for the next five years in regards to PFAS, this would be the document you'd want to see uh, and review. It's uh, uh, readily available on the internet. That's it for today. Any questions? Thank you, Howard. Yes, we will go ahead and open up for questions. Again, you can feel free to use the raise your hand feature if you would like to ask Howard a question directly or you can type in your question either in the questions box or the chat box. We'll go ahead and give it a few minutes. We did have one question come in um, during the presentation from Craig. He did ask, do you have any info on when the EPA will release methods for soils or non-potable waters? You know, I don't, I've heard anywhere from this year to next. So I, I've not heard of a deadline that they put out there. Um, so it's just kind of a wait and see. Thank you. Again, we'll go ahead and um, take a few more moments so everyone can write their questions in.
while we are waiting, I did want to just um, let everyone know that we do record these webinars. We post them on our ALS website as well as our YouTube channel. We post them the following week. You just can search for ALS Limited to find our channel and click on our playlist. We post this webinar as well as past webinar Wednesdays and other valuable resources. And if you come up with questions later, you can certainly email. Of course. And we do have a question coming in from Amy. Um, why are you freezing drying, I'm sorry, freeze drying soil samples for homogenization or other reason? So to remove water and to get better, yes, to better homogenize uh, soils and tissues, <clears throat> we found we have far better uh, reproducibility when we freeze dry our, our soils or sediments. I don't see any additional questions coming in, but yes, Howard's information is listed here. You can feel free to give um, send him an email or give him a call with any personal questions. Um, one last question to come from Matt. He's asking, are you offering PFOS analysis for air samples slash stack samples? Air slash what? Um, air samples or stack samples? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we do offer stationary source uh, analysis, so that's um, that would be Impinger Solutions, and yeah, we've done quite a bit of that work. Uh, if you're doing stationary source um, analysis, uh, we can give you some uh, information about what's the precedence on what's been used in the past on uh, for sampling, and then yeah, we do the uh, we've even made up the uh, Impinger Solutions and uh, then do the analysis. But as far as uh, personal or ambient air monitoring, I've really not seen a method that's been published yet for that, or we haven't been involved in doing any of um, that analysis. Thank you. We also have a question. Um, are you, I think this was a, from Amy's question earlier about the soil samples. Um, are you mix, are you grinding them or just mixing them for her soil samples? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, before freeze drying, but well, we're not going to. Uh, it all depends on what what uh, the client wants. Uh, we will attempt to attempt to take representative samples um, as far as size wise, but then we will. Uh, and this pertains a lot to sediments being there so wet and we get globs going on that we will freeze dry those, and then. Um, uh, those can be sieved or ground, so um, you have a nice homogeneous uh, sample, then we subsample those for analysis. Perfect. A follow-up to Matt's question, <clears throat> excuse me, about the PFAS analysis for air samples and stack samples. You wanted to know as well, are you offering the top and XAD-2 raisin as well? Uh, we can do, yeah, well, that's interesting. We've not done top assay on um, on stationary source sample and pinger solutions. Uh, we'd have to take, we probably could. I could take a look at that and talk with the lab about it, but um, I think we could probably do that. Perfect. And another question from Misty. She asks, where can I get a list of the list of all the compounds and methods for ALS Kelso and or Michigan offers? I can send those to you. Perfect. Go I ahead will. And, your and I can send you her information as well um, after the webinar. And Mike also asks, um, how can he access these? I'm not quite sure what he is wanting to access. Um, but Mike, if you did have a direct question for Howard, I'm sure you can send him an email and ask him where to get those that information. He says, okay. <laughs> All right. 
I don't see any additional questions coming in and no hands are raised, so we'll go ahead and close up. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn as we post um, future webinar Wednesdays on that site as well um, as other valuable resources too. So thank you again, um, Howard, for the presentation today. And um, everyone, thank you again for attending and enjoy the rest of your week.